Welcome to you all today. I'm Paul Pepys, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Lori Gruen, the William Griffin Professor of Philosophy and Professor of Feminist, Gender and Sexuality Studies and Environmental Studies at Wesleyan University, where she also coordinates Wesleyan Animal Studies. Gruen's work lies at the intersection of ethical theory and practice, with a particular focus on issues that impact those often overlooked in traditional ethical investigations, women, people of color, non-human animals. Her latest book is Entangled Empathy, an alternative ethic for our relationships with animals. Gruen gave a talk titled Justice and Empathy Beyond the Human on March 10th, 2016, as the Oregon Humanities Center's 2015-16 Robert D. Clark Lecturer. Her talk was part of this year-long justice series. Thank you so much for being with us. It's my pleasure. What led to your interest in thinking about how people relate to non-human animals? It's a really nice question. I have always been interested in other animals, and I've spent a lot of my time with other animals. Um, but part of it also had to do with thinking about the role that other animals play in our sort of social world. And by that, I mean something more akin to the sort of both visibility and invisibility of the other animals. So we sort of have them all over the place. They're in storybooks. They're in um, our myths. Um, we have them in our homes. Um, we watch nature documentaries about other animals. But we also have them at a bit of a distance. And so my interest is in bringing them closer and paying more attention to our relationships with them. And those are varying kinds of relationships. So you, the key phrase in, in the new work is entangled empathy. Mm -hmm. So tell me about that term. What do you mean by entangled and, and how do you mean empathy? You don't mean empathy in any old way. There's yeah. particular ways. Tell us yeah. about that term. So I'll start with empathy and then go back mm -hmm. to entangled. Um, so the way that people have ordinarily thought about empathy, but you could you could get many, many different ideas of what empathy is, and people have very distinct ideas about what empathy is. A lot of the ideas about empathy are based on a notion that what you're doing is you're putting yourself into the shoes of another. And of course, as animals don't wear shoes, so how do you put yourself in their shoes? But it's really about putting yourself in the perspective of another. But often the way that people have thought about empathy is that it's an uh, effective or an emotional um, state, that you try to take on the feelings of the other animals. Um, and my view of empathy is different because it's not really just taking on the emotions of other animals. It's also thinking about what those emotions might be, how they're the same, and how they're different from our own emotions. Moving back and forth between your own perspective and their perspective, that's a very helpful process. And also really thinking about how they might have come to have the experiences or feelings or emotions that they have, what they're thinking. So there's both an emotional part and a cognitive part. So for empathy, you're doing a, com it's a complicated process. Now entanglement is, is a very, uh, tricky notion to add on to this, but entanglement I take from a uh, uh, feminist philosopher of science, um, Karen Barad, and her view is that, and this comes from physics actually, um, that her view is that what we're doing when we are in these complicated relationships is co-constituting each other's agency. Um, and so entanglement is the process whereby um, these different things, they're not even beings, but different things come together to become what they are. And so for me, entangled empathy is a process uh, that's both emotional and rational or cognitive, and it also shapes who we are and we shape in turn who we're empathizing with. So it's this co-constituting effective and reflective process. So your con conception of empathy is a is in part a kind of corrective. That you, you, there are ways that empathy goes wrong, are there not? Right. So, so, so let's talk about that a little bit. One of the things that um, is central to that reflection is to try to figure out the ways that we might be projecting, mm -hmm. we might be overreacting. I'm actually, I think a lot of theoretical work, a lot of scholarly work is to some extent therapeutic. I think you, it's an interesting... Therapeutic for the scholar. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a sense, if, if you look at different people's interests and the ways in which they come to those interests, um, I think there's always something a little bit interesting about why it was that they came to those topics. Mm -hmm. In my own case, mm -hmm. um, I'm often overly empathetic. And I um, have had to do a lot of correction. And I think a lot of people who spend time 
worrying about other animals and their plight um, can sometimes misunderstand or miss uh, perceive what might be happening. And I just saw a nature documentary in which this was true. Elephants were walking their typical 30 miles, and the narrator was talking about the elephants plodding and drudging. And I thought, no, that's not, that's <laughs> what you would feel if you were walking 30 miles in the hot desert. But it's not <laughs> what the elephants might be feeling. So there's a way in which I, I myself um, am overly empathetic sometimes mm -hmm. and need to correct um, that. And I think I'm overly sensitive to suffering, for example, um, with humans and other animals. And so part of my theorizing about what needs to be corrected is based on that process. So sometimes we're overly empathetic. What we need to do is understand that our perspective is not the same as another's perspective. Um, try to understand what might be going on um, in that process that the other's experiencing. I mentioned suffering. Sometimes suffering is an experience that's just one aspect of a larger experience. And if you focus too much on one aspect of a larger experience, you miss the other aspects. So those are the kinds of correctives um, that are, I think, important. And this is related to your skepticism about a certain kind of um, rights discourse. Mm -hmm. uh, so say a little bit about that. So one of the, one of the ways in which people talk about animals is defending animal rights. And, yeah. and you've had some questions or some uh, skepticism about that. Tell us about that. Yeah, the, the idea that um, we owe other animals um, more than we currently give them, I think I completely agree with. What I don't think is the right way to go about it is to think about it in terms of uh, these very distinct claims that they might make on us. Um, that's a type of theorizing that puts them at a distance. And I'm interested in sort of understanding the relationships that we have. Rights tend to miss certain important features of those relationships. Um, we tend to say, often project our own concerns, as I was just mentioning. But we also can um, see those others as, you know, quite different from us, quite distinct from us, and in ways that uh, cause us to miss what matters to them from their own point of view. And I think that's a really important um, issue. We want to focus on them not because they are um, only suffering, all and only suffering, but because they have rich relationships themselves. Um, one of the, the examples I often use is that um, one of the leaders in the animal rights world, Peter Singer, who's not actually a rights theorist uh, straightforwardly. He, he actually thinks in terms of um, a utilitarian framework. Uh, but one of the things that he often says is that chimpanzees are similar to three-year-old humans. And I think the three-year-old chimpanzees I know aren't even similar to three-year-old humans, and the 20-year-old <laughs> chimpanzees I know are nothing like three-year-old humans. So this is one of the things that often happens when you're in a framework where you're not attending to the specificity and the particularity of those other individuals. What you're doing is you're using the human frame of reference and you're, you're assimilating all the other animals into that frame of reference. And I think Wright's discourse has a tendency to do that. You you've made a very strong case for this importance of um, a kind of deliberative relationship as well as a kind of emotive relationship. And it's clear also that this, I mean, you're a philosopher, and so you're a philosopher, you're thinking about uh, non-human animals, and in fact your work is part of a, a larger emerging field in the academy which is called animal studies, and you coordinate animal studies at Wesleyan. Tell us a little bit about that field. What's, where did it come from? What's happening in it now, and why is it important? Animal studies has really uh, become a very important part of um, the academy, and there's really exciting developments in animal studies, and there's also interesting and important tensions. It's always true when you have field, fields forming. Um, one of the most exciting things from my point of view about animal studies and its emergence is its interdisciplinarity. Mm -hmm. So we have all sorts of scholars who have maybe backgrounds in literary studies, in cultural studies, in philosophy like myself, in anthropology, um, in certain social sciences, so sociology, um, coming together to talk about the very different ways that human lives intersect with non-human lives. And in, in very um, 
robust ways, animal studies is looking at those the relationships between humans and other animals, whether they're actual relationships, whether they're virtual relationships, whether they're literary, whether they're historical. And one of the things that we're finding um, by looking closer at the animals that we kind of took as the background, mm -hmm. once we foreground those animals, is we're learning a lot more about sort of our own interactions, our own histories, our own processes, um, our own needs, our own desires, our interests. So it's a very exciting area in the academy at the moment. So the last point you made is, is one of the things that's most fascinating to me about this is the way that this kind of um, engaged, deliberative, emotional um, contemplation of our relationships with animals tells us not just something about them, mm -hmm. but also something about us. Right. So can you give me an example of um, how, uh, so an example of that, of, of that teaching, they teach us something instead of us being only the agents in this encounter? Well, part of what I think, this is the entanglement, part of my entangled empathy again, and I, I have to go back to um, a, a chimpanzee who's now, she's now an adult, but she was a, a young chimpanzee when I met her. Um, and. I do not advocate interacting with chimpanzees the way I interacted with her when she was younger. Um, it's very dangerous to interact with wild um, animals and um, this was in a very specific, very controlled context. But what ended up happening in this encounter, I was interested in a fairly abstract study of animal cognition, animal minds, what do they think. Um, chimpanzees are at the core of that um, and have been historically for, for a number of decades, thinking about what they can know. There's chimpanzees that have been used in language studies to try to figure out whether we can communicate with them in our own human languages, um, to try to understand whether they can add and make discriminations, whether they have theory of mind, all of that sort of thing. Um, and so I was working with a cognition lab, and Emma Chimpanzee um, really just wanted to get to know me. Um, so we were wandering around in the woods. I was a little nervous. It was, uh, it was not something I had done in the United States <laughs> before. Um, and she knew I was nervous and jumped into my arms and pressed herself against me. Um, and uh, we wandered, we wandered around um, the woods and she made sure that I got myself comfortable. Now, it was a, it was a really interesting encounter. I think she knew more about my mm. physical state than I knew about her physical state. Um, she helped calm me um, and in that process she revealed to me something that I really wasn't able to theorize about in the abstract, that embodied encounter that we had, um, really helped me to see the relationship that we can have with animals as we can be transformed by those relationships. And, a, and that was a very vivid case of that. I mean, I've lived with dogs for a long time. Many people live with dogs. We learn a lot from our dogs. Mm -hmm. um, they help reveal all sorts of things, including our neuroses, mm -hmm. which <laughs> I think um, is very useful. But this encounter with Emma was really remarkable, and it shifted my, my attention and a lot of my scholarship, um, my concerns um, after that very, very intimate encounter with a chimpanzee. So one of those con particular concerns is concerns about um, chimpanzees in captivity, mm -hmm. and one of your works is on the topic of captivity, and animal liberation is another one. Um, how did you become interested in chimpanzees that are in captivity in particular? So, I again, I was interested in these questions about animal cognition, and um, began doing work on a particular group of chimpanzees that were used in um, early cognitive experiments um, at the uh, Yerkes, um, what was then the Robert M. Yerkes um, Institute in Orangeport, Florida, before it moved to Emory. Mm -hmm. um, and I began doing um, historical work to try to sort of discover, um, you know, what, what was motivating that inquiry. Uh, we're talking about in the 20s, and 1920s, 1930s. And I was doing some archival research, which is pretty unusual for a philosopher to do, but I was doing some archival research and I came across this list that Robert Yerkes put together of the first 100 chimpanzees. And as a result of his interest in this list keeping, I became interested in not just helping to make that list known um, as a way of representing um, these individuals from whom we've learned a lot, um, but I, I also wanted to sort of give 
individual understandings. These chimpanzees all had names, and I wanted to make visible who these chimpanzees were and what their relationships with each other um, was, where they came from. So I developed a website called The First 100 Chimpanzees, mm -hmm. um, and it really sort of brought to life this first colony of captive chimpanzees. And as a result of that work, which came from really my interest in what animals think, what animals feel, and how that work began to really start to think about captivity in a different way. And so then that's how I became interested in chimpanzee captivity and other forms of captivity. And that first 100 website then morphed into the last 1,000 chimpanzee so website. So what is the last 1,000 chimpanzee so website? So quite amazingly to my deep surprise, we are now actually at a period of time when chimpanzee research is coming to an end. And I would have not believed that to be the case. But chimpanzee research has come to an end. Um, and before that day occurred, I thought it was useful and with the encouragement of some primatologists um, and others developed the last 1,000 website, which was really um, to identify the remaining chimpanzees that are in captivity in the United States and to track their movement to sanctuary. And now um, they're slowly but surely moving to sanctuary, and it's remarkable. What is the key uh, change that happened? That so that? there was a, a group of chimpanzees that were in semi-retirement in New Mexico. And the, a group, a small group of them, were moved to um, a facility that was doing um, both biomedical research and behavioral research on chimpanzees in Texas, and that caused a bit of an outcry. And um, politicians, activists, animal welfare individuals, and various scientists and ethicists as well, um, all raised concerns. That those concerns um, were brought to the Institute of Medicine. They conducted. Uh, a set of studies to determine whether we needed to use chimpanzees in research. They found we didn't scientifically need to use them, and the National Institutes of Health decided that they weren't going to fund continued research. And now what we do have is about 375 chimpanzees that are, uh, maybe 350, that are owned by by you and me, the taxpayer. Mm -hmm. um, they're still in laboratories. They need to be gone. They need to be moved to sanctuary. And there's about another 300 or so that are privately owned, that are currently held in laboratories. And it's unclear what will happen with those. So, about 675 chimpanzees, roughly, um, who are still of that last 1,000, still in captive conditions. I know. I'm someone who's lived with rats. My mm. daughter has had rats for many years, and um, I know that you you feel this way about rats because anyone who spends time with rats realizes that they're incredibly advanced, sensitive, intelligent creatures. Is anything going on with rat experimentation along these lines? Yeah, it's a, it, you know it's a very um, interesting and it's very uh, disturbing question. Um, rats are incredibly sophisticated. Um, remarkably social, and very, very smart. Unfortunately, rats aren't even considered animals under the Animal Welfare Act. Hmm. Mice, rats, and birds um, have been excluded from the Animal Welfare Act protection. And this was a political maneuver. There's some work being done um, to try to include rats and mice um, under the Animal Welfare Act. But right now, rats and mice are used in most laboratory research without protections, mm -hmm. at least without federal protections. I have to say that um, many of the researchers that I've met who work in smaller laboratories, particularly on cognition research and psychological research, who've worked with rats, mm -hmm. just as you say, they know just how smart and sensitive they are. So there are, there are very um, cautious researchers that even if there is no protection under the Animal Welfare Act, are taking very good care um, of the rats. That doesn't mean they're not using them. Mm -hmm. and it doesn't mean they aren't still laboratory instruments, but there's an awareness by many. Um, but unfortunately, no, rats are, are not protected. How does your work in philosophy, women and gender studies, and environmental studies intersect with your work uh, on animals? So one of the things that I think is um, really important to think about is the ways in which structures of disenfranchisement, structures of disposability, speaking of rats, um, structures of killability um, 
operate at mutually reinforcing levels. That's kind of abstract, but the idea is that we have these systems in place that mark some as important and others as disposable or unimportant. And that's not just other animals, that's other humans. Um, and so I think interestingly to study the ways in which oppression and instrumentalization and exploitation operates at a structural level helps us to see commonalities, not that they're only commonalities, but commonalities with other areas. And so my work in animal studies um, parallels really nicely with my work in feminist studies and anti-racism. Um, work as well. My, I do work with um, incarcerated individuals as well, and that feeds in very nicely to my thinking about um, captivity and the ways in which capt captivity can be harmful, the ways in which individuals can be really alienated and become uh, sort of disintegrated within context of captivity. So I think there are parallels um, that can be illuminating. Uh, I don't think there their similarities. It's not to say that rats in a laboratory and humans in captivity have the exact same experiences or are in any way other than sort of structurally similarly um, situated. So for me, my work um, at the margins um, is an important part of understanding how systems of power are operating and how we might make change. So you mentioned the work that you do in prisons. Tell us about that work. What is it that you do? There? So I've been teaching uh, philosophy in a maximum security men's prison for six years and the students there are able to learn um, a text that they wouldn't have ordinarily come across so I mean historical text contemporary text reading Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau Merleau-Ponty Husserl um, Sartre it's been really uh, again another one of those entangled empathetic experiences on my end because I've learned more um, about myself and about my pedagogy and my teaching um, from those experiences and I'm hopeful uh, that they too are learning a lot about their own experiences how to rethink and reframe um, how they see the world. Uh, it's, mass incarceration is a, a serious serious problem um, and it's a serious problem for a variety of reasons but from my point of view as someone who's sort of deeply concerned about flourishing at the core of all of my sort of theoretical work is the desire for us to think anew about our relationships with one another and, uh, and other animals and to try to bring about more flourishing um, and the system of mass incarceration is destructive of all sorts of flourishing. It destroys the lives of the people who are incarcerated. Um, many of them also have been involved in destructive and violent behavior as well. Um, and so I'm not, I don't mean to diminish that. There's also a lack of flourishing that they brought about. But there's a cycle. Um, their families, their communities um, are, uh, are in bad shape. And I think that shining a, a spotlight on the system of mass incarceration is what justice and empathy both demand. So you are, I'm sure, aware that there's been some arguments in the New York Times of late uh, about philosophy and about that philosophy has become too arcane and irrelevant. But you've defended, and you've just done it here, uh, philosophy's liberatory potential. I'm, I, I, I'm the director of the Oregon Humanities Center. I'm an English professor, and people are always telling me the humanities, they don't matter anymore. Mm -hmm. Tell me why philosophy matters, why what you do is so important to do. Philosophy has had just a wonderful um, impact on my way of seeing the world. But in my teaching, um, philosophy has opened avenues of thinking that were, were not previously open. And I think about this in both my current courses on the Wesleyan campus, but also my courses on the Cheshire and the Cheshire Correctional Institute. And that is that when you do philosophy, you have to learn to take somebody else's perspective and you have to reflect on an experience that's really potentially quite foreign. And that reflection opens up possibilities that weren't previously available. Um, it opens up uh, a landscape that you might not have seen before. So in that sense, I think philosophy can be expansive. But I also think philosophical ref reflection has direct impact on thinking about how we might make the world one in which we can flourish. 
and making the world less um, harmful, less prejudiced, less problematic, and more just. And so I think philosophy is both um, personally liberatory and also can help us to bring about a better world. So we have just a couple of minutes left. Um, you, you have worked in many areas. You've produced many books on a very wide range of things. What are you working on now? I have a <laughs> that I do have a lot of interests, um, <laughs> and I'm I'm putting together um, a book on animal cognition, and so one of the ideas um, that started me in my chimpanzee work ages ago was thinking about animal minds and other minds, how we understand them, um, and so I'm working on a book on animal cognition that takes a little bit of a different tack than some of the books that have come out, and there's been a lot of interest in this topic lately. Um, and so what I'm interested in trying to understand is what it means to be another animal. Um, part of my work on empathy is to try to really empathize with what it's like to be another animal. So we have to understand what that is. And so my current work is trying to get a little bit deeper into that question. And how do you do that? Part of the way, part of the way I do it is by um, talking to people who spend a lot of time with other animals. Um, part of the way I do it is spending time with other animals. And um, that's a really important way. There's also a lot of scientific research that's been done. Um, thinking about theories of perception, theories of cognition is also central to that work. Um, how do we understand the mind of anybody else? That's such a deep, old philosophical question. How do I understand what anybody else might be thinking. So trying to figure out those questions um, and putting it in a very specific context of a penguin, an octopus, a chimpanzee, a dog. These are, these are really hard questions. Um, we don't want to just project ourselves onto other animals. We don't want to see other animals' experiences as only through our own lens. And so um, I'm hoping that I can help people to see how other animals might see the world. Well, good luck answering those very hard questions. Thank you. thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. And thank you for talking with me. I've been speaking with Lori Gruen, Professor of Philosophy and Animal Studies at Wesleyan University. Gruen gave a talk titled Justice and Empathy Beyond the Human on March 10th, 2016, as the Oregon Humanities Center's 2015-16 Robert D. Clark Lecturer. Her talk was part of the year-long Justice Series. Thanks so much for watching.